say something. Ah, we are now live. <laughs> Hi, Tessa. Hi, Garvia. <laughs> um, I guess I should, I should formally introduce you, really. The author of six novels, two books for young people and one nonfiction book, which we're going to talk about today. Um, your work has been nominated for the Governor General's Award. Uh, Tessa's work has um, picked up the Toronto Book Award, OCM Bocas Prize. She is a winner of the Eccles British Library Award in 2018. Uh, Tessa is the Professor of Creative Writing at the University of East Aglia. Now, Tessa McQuad's foray into nonfiction is a work that is nothing short of remarkable. It's called Shame on Me, An Anatomy of Race and Belonging, a memoir. Um, to call it a memoir, to me, doesn't exactly hit it on the head. I feel like memoir is too small. It's uh, too small a label to put on a work that intertwines history and science and literature and mythology and geopolitics and the story of a multi-generational family with roots that spread to each and every continent. It's ambitious and poetic and dense and satisfying. And I'm so pleased to be sitting here with you, Tessa. How are you? I'm really well, Garvia. Thank you so much for being here. And um, thank you. And I wanted to thank um, the Drawn and Quarterly. And I also really want to thank Tonya Addison, who's worked tirelessly to get this thing off the ground, which is no small feat um, during the time. So it's really great. And I'm, and I'm well, you know, in, in lockdown in London and in sort of lockdown in London, yes. <laughs> you know? so, but I'm well and I'm really glad to be here. I wish I could have been here, there in Montreal for the launch, which was in March that, and the book happened to come out, I think two, a day after we officially went into lockdown in, in Montreal, so. Your timing is fantastic. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have, have you been able to fet yourself in any way as this, um, as the book launches and is out into the world and, and being lauded here and there and everywhere? Well, fet in terms of going out to a park, doing some <laughs> running, um, yeah, reading some nice books. So yeah. yeah. That's what you're doing. That's yeah, fine. Yeah. Um, before we get into this conversation, and it's a conversation I've been looking forward to for uh, since, since the book uh, arrived on, on my doorstep, um, I would love for you to kind of set the table so to speak. Sure. Um, it's a, a little bit of reading from Shame On Me. Um, so let's begin with your words and your voice and we'll begin at the beginning, if that's okay. Great, yes. Um, so the book's divided into um, sections that are a kind of um, experiment and, um, and I'm gonna read from the first section, which is hypothesis. A young Chinese woman, so young, nearly still a girl, runs through a field of sugarcane. Her cotton shift is torn, her hair wild, there is fear on her face. My grandmother. She's escaping something terrible. Her legs are scraped by sharp stalks. Blood is dripping from her knee. I imagine her eyes are streaming with tears. She is running because in her countryside village in Demerara, British Guyana, she has just been raped by her uncle. I imagine my Indian ancestor as a strong woman, perhaps originally from Ud, modern Uttar Pradesh, who could squat easily, hunched over green, sword-like leaves sprouting from emerging stalks. She is exhausted, pulling weeds out of unfamiliar soil in British Guyana. Thin, fragile from the 112-day journey by ship, she is lucky to have survived on a daily ration of beef or pork, suet, a biscuit, a few raisins. My Arawak ancestor is in a dugout coral on the Bora Bora River that runs through the Iwakrama forest. She paddles past a giant otter sunning itself on a tree stump. My Portuguese ancestor, perhaps from Madeira, arrives among the first free immigrants to the colony in 1835. In her small Hessian sack, she has hidden 20 delicate squares of lace that she stitched while watching her father haul his fishing nets from the sea. 
There's a rumor about my French ancestor, but she will never confirm for anyone in the colony that her father had a chalice and a silver, silver ring with a hexagon pattern, the Star of David, hidden in his suitcase when he arrived from France. Mm. My African great-great-grandmother is lost amongst trees that don't know her name, don't speak her language, trees that have erased her. She can't find the path that will take her to the clearing. She is getting weak. I reach out to take her by the hand. My Scottish great-great-great-grandmother takes her last breath in East Lothian, and the book she has been reading falls across her chest. She never knows about the brown women with their hands in the soil. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That is quite a way to begin this, what really is just a, a journey that um, that as geographically we're, we're, we are everywhere, but we are through time and space and myth and story. And I just want, I wonder about this because most of us know you as a novelist, an essayist, and now this is this foray into this other world that is, is nonfiction, but so much more than that. Mm. What catapulted you into this, into this chapter in your writing life? Yeah, it's a good question. I, you know, I think I've been dealing with all of the same things that I deal with in this book throughout my whole writing career. I've been dealing with belonging. I've been dealing with dislocation and disruption. I've been dealing with race and, and, and othering. And I've been dealing with, um, you know, kind of finding new ways to talk about race. And I think, you know, events in the recent, the last few years and, you know, events around 2016 here in Britain, we had um, Brexit, you know, the, the Americans elected their current president. Um, and uh, and it, it just sort of catapulted me into feeling that the, 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 the division was going to come to a head, which I think it actually has and is still um, and the divisions between people and that racialization of, of, of um, uh, people for the at an at a opportune moment um, like, like we, we're living now um, you know racialization comes into play and I think it was just becoming so strong for me that I couldn't deal with it obliquely anymore I couldn't really deal with it through fiction and through kind of hiding it in in other people's stories and other characters mm -hmm. so I just had to you know kind of Look at it, own it, um, put myself in in all of the in in all of the things that I had been talking about through fiction. Put it out there much more directly. I think yeah. I felt I felt angry. I felt hugely angry, and it's not that I haven't felt angry about race race issues throughout my life. It's just that it you know it's really come to the fore. Mm -hmm. But in in this, you decided though because you could have gone a route of a, a Tyanasi Coates or or something like like that, mm -hmm. but you went much more to a personal place, which I think is really interesting, especially you and I were talking just earlier about both coming to um, Canada as immigrants around the same age. We're both mm -hmm. around three years old. And um, you, you wrote this um, in, in this, in this memoir, if you give me, if you'll indulge me in reading your own. Sure. <laughs> My mother often let slip nuggets of family history that were at times uncomfortable, at other times mysterious and poetic, and still to her time so distant and unreachable that they could only become a myth or become myth. She had no way of knowing that she was feeding a writer. Mm. Other than the feeding a writer part of it, <laughs> I feel like this is just such a parallel to so many of us in the in this um, immigrant, in the immigrant experience, mm. the idea that our that our parents they bring us here, and what we need to do is just push forward. And there's yeah. not there's very little looking back. Yeah. There's very little telling of our stories by our parents to us. And yeah. so I wonder for you when it hit you that you needed to pull these threads of who you are together when you became cognizant that this mm. is important to you, you know, in your yeah. growth as just a writer and a, and a woman. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, you know, as, as someone who's, because I've moved, I've, I, I arrived in Canada, like you said, at, at three, I moved um, in Toronto, and then I moved later to Kingston and to Montreal. Um, I lived many years in Montreal before I moved to London. And I think when you come from such disruption, some of it is um, and as I deal with that in the book, it's not just my disruption, it's ancestors, you know, disruption. And I'm just sort of perpetuating that kind of move, moving and that mi migration. I think it's really at certain points in your life important to gather all the bits and to, and, and to you know, try to make sense of all of the bits. And it's personal because, yes, I could make a, I could write an essay on race and I could write an essay on belonging, but I I, I think because of my particular um, genetic makeup and 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 the history of that, all of that moving, it I needed to make it personal in order to dissect that idea of race on my own body. I needed to use my own body in order to make it real and make it true for for me, but also for the reader. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like you also had to do it to? Um to settle a certain thing within yourself because it feels like there is a settling of of you as we as we go through this mm -hmm. journey with you um, yeah i think the settling I, th I thought that the settling happened before i started to write the book because i thought there's a section in there where i deal with with um you know my my um psychoanalysis and and yeah. you know that the parts of me that were drawn together to be to belong just to me not to any other place in any kind of um identity other than you know my own but uh, a belonging that i had to give myself but but with the book coming out and with the responses to the book i realized that there is um a settling of the complexity and you know and there's a line in the in the book um about I, when i go to cambodia and I, and i and i say that that I, I really want to belong there i want to be part of my grandmother's you know sort of asian um background and 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 i and then i don't you know, obviously, and mm. and so um, I say that that I, I can't belong to one, any one place, and there's no shame in that. There's no shame in not not being in in you know having one singular identity. Mm. It's it's funny that you you bring up shame because it's not only um, the 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 title. Um, it is a a theme that runs throughout the memoir. Something that that I feel like you both dance with and fight with <laughs> throughout yeah. the, it's just like this constant companion. Yeah. And I wonder why shame? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I, I don't think that there's a, a situation around race that doesn't involve shame, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I also don't think that, I, and I don't think I'm alone in saying that we live in a structure, a societal structure that is shameful. Mm. And there are, and, and I know very few people who are completely comfortable with living there and not changing it. You know, my, the people that I know want to change that structure. And so um, there's shame in still in, in perpetuating it. There's say a shame in, in kind of living in a structure um, in which the inequality is so um, uh, huge, it's so vast. But also in particular for this, for the idea of, in the book, you know, there's shame um, in in ancestry, you know, there's shame in um, coming from uh, you know Scottish ancestors who were um, slave uh, uh, plantation overseers, and there's also shame on that other side in in which uh, there's a fantastic line from Carol Phillips in his book Crossing the River that opens the book, which is um, a, a, a desperate foolishness. The crops failed. I sold my children. Oh. So there's you know there's two there are two places that that shame comes from and i think that anything that deals with such inequality involves shame mm -hmm. and so um that's where the book comes from and it's the the title of the book comes from and 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 the shame is on me because it's part of my physical biological um makeup so it's come to me it's passed down to me through all of those generations mm -hmm. did you did you feel it as you as you came into yourself as not just, like I said, not just as a writer, but as a woman, did you feel that shame in just your everyday being? Yeah, I think that I think that not feeling like you belong, like not feeling like always feeling like you're trying to fit in, always feeling like you're not quite enough, always feeling like you're um, you've done something wrong by being excluded. 
because that's how it usually feels. That's you, you know, even though you're excluded and it has nothing to you, it nothing to do with you, you feel like you've done something wrong. I think that could be interpreted as shame, you know, that that you that you think you needed to do better somehow. Mm -hmm. And the book deals with that idea of doing better and that and the doing better is in the structure of the, you know, the plantation that that still that would that created my background, but all that so that still exists, you know, in a kind of economic stru structure that says if you work hard, you will get these to these places and you know belong somewhere in in success. Mm -hmm. And um, and that success is is um, is the thing that breeds the shame. I yeah, think. yeah. Um, I was listening to an interview with um, Ocean Vong recently. Yeah, yeah. Who speaks so beautifully about exactly that and that and and the danger that it's it's for our ancestors, even our parents. There is something that's so precarious and, and dangerous about unearthing that shame too much yeah. or unearthing the source of it yeah. too much yeah. that somehow it will, it will um, stop our progress. Yes, yes, because the desire, the desire is, is um, the engine to, you know, get out of shame, you know, so you want to get out and you want to have, have something that, that, um, that, creates uh, a sense of belonging, I suppose. And when you grow up in, in Canada, you know, when that sense of belonging is narrated by a particular um, way of being, a, a kind of white state of mind, is what I talk about in the book as well, then, then that belonging becomes a, a desire, you know, the desire becomes to be, to a belonging in, in a realm that doesn't belong to you mm. at all. So, yes. it be, so it comes with contradiction and shame and, and um, and uh, failure mm. not constantly it <laughs> couldn't possibly be, you know. It's, it's a courageous way that you tackle all of it. Um, there was a, at certain points when I, when uh, in reading the book that I felt like there are so many threads that you have to pull together. There's so much within you that you're trying to sort of unravel so that you can put it all together again. Mm. And I'm, and I'm wondering if this exploration, because we talk about your ancestry being Indian and African and Chinese and French and Scottish and Portuguese, all of these things, um, and coming from um, Guyana, was there ever a time where you feel like you were overwhelmed by your own threads that this <laughs> as, like, I mean, really as to, to be able to, this to me could have been uh, six parts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, and I, and I would just wonder as not just in with your craft, as well as, you know, digging through it all, if it ever felt like it's, this is a lot, this is, it's a lot. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. All the time. And I, and I started out with, um, thinking that I had a whole year to just research everything because mm -hmm. I won the Eccles Award and it was just I was going to just swan around the British Library and do those six parts you know create um, a, 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 or find out really un unpack and, and and discover things about the past of each of those a past of the, the heritage and the ancestors of each of those parts of me um, but I also you know, wanted to make it current, and I wanted to, you know, limit the idea of discovery to, to be something that was urgent. And so I picked, you know, a, a summer. I also had a book deadline. <laughs> so of course, yeah, there's that like, practicality. Yeah. So I kind of picked a, um, a, a period of time uh, through which I was going to journey through these questions, um, and it happened to take place during, you know, 2017, the hottest summer um, that we've had, I think, on both sides of the Atlantic and where, where you know, cars are burning and fires are burning. So um, it just happened to coincide with, with that, with me being in the present and going back into the past of all these parts of myself that it felt like I was really dealing with the plantation, you know, that that place in, in, in um, British Guyana that, that I came from. And so it felt really, um, it felt right to, to limit it to time and, and you know, instead of, six volumes <laughs> <laughs> there's probably 
more volumes in you, I bet. I mean, were, did any of these stories that you, that, I mean, so many of them are, are chronicled here, but of the individual ancestors, um, you, you read of their, of your imaginings of some of them so beautifully written, um, but were there any stories that, that, that came to you where you, you thought, where you were feeling that perhaps this is something that I have to go back to? Um, I think, yes, I think, I mean, my next novel is based in India. And so um, I think I'm going back there in a, in a way, in an imaginative way, obviously. Um, and, and, and I think that I'm really interested in um, sort of the Arawak um, side, because there wasn't, there, there wasn't very much in the time that I had um, of for me to to find out about you know it wasn't like I'd like to and there and with all the bits you know like like you said I'm really having to imagine them because there's no real trace you know there's ancestry.com but there's no real trace in our family as to who these actual people are and and I'm not sure that that's as important as the stories that came that got handed down I think the stories actually are more meaningful for me than than tracing the actual people Mm. Um, you use this uh, this really great um, device to split up the uh, chapters and you hint at it, an anatomy of race and belonging. Um, chapters called nose and blood, skin and ass, lips, eyes, hair, bones. Such an incredibly, <laughs> it's so visceral. Yeah. for one so yeah. as as a reader you can't help but be pulled into that yeah. I wonder about that exploration of anatomy yeah. and and why why you went there one of the things about that that the book tries to do is to talk about race as a construct um, that doesn't exist that we create constantly over and over and over so it, it exists because people actually get shot and be abused in the street you know it exists absolutely but as a biological concept it's been um, uh, proven to to not be valid so I wanted to take that physical biological um, aspect of it and break it down and break it down to racialized parts of the body and using my own body to sort of sh to show that um, or to undermine the stereotypes mm. of, of race so that we would have to accept that race is a power construct that people use to um, to make difference and to um, make um, make hierarchies mm -hmm. and to keep and to keep those hierarchies manifest in our current society and so you know one of the points I make about you know that we're still living on the plantation the fact that there's still so much anti-black violence has to do with the fact that we are still living that construct of the of the plantation you know and and so that i wanted to break it down as and yet reinforce the fact that we still are are living it yeah yeah um there's a <laughs> and you and you're breaking it down and, and living it within yourself as well there's an yeah. uh, interesting moment where you have a conversation with a friend who says you are I hate these kind of conversations when friends I know what you're gonna say. <laughs> yeah. you. Man, yeah. your friend says to you, you're socially white, politically black, and culturally both. And you had a very strong reaction to that sort of assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder about the trajectory that that put you on once yeah. your friend heard, um, kind of just laid you out like that. Yeah, well, um, shame, you know, shame, right. because because it, it somehow um, suggested that I was divided, that I wasn't true, that I wasn't real, that I wasn't loyal, that I was, you know, that I was, um, uh, the, the, you know, the social whiteness in my in my construct of whiteness in the book, you know, meant that I lived in the master's house and not in the in the field. And so there, there was shame involved in that. And I think understanding that made me 
also, this happened just before I wrote the book, he said this, and, and it just made me see how much one person could be many things, you know, mm -hmm. one person could be all those things. And so that it wasn't about body parts, it was about um, privilege, um, choices, uh, you know, kind of background, you know, where you grew up, uh, and, and those kinds of things affecting um, how one lives in the world. Mm. And I and I happen to have a lot of privilege. Um, and so that made me have to unpick that. And that's partly why the book is so personal, because, you know, I, I, I do go through my own, um, my I, I unpick my own whiteness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you say that you embody both privilege and oppression. Yeah. Um, and that is, you know, that is something to, to, to grapple with. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the grappling of it. Um, are you still friends with that person? Yes. I haven't seen oh, him good. in a long time, but I, <laughs> it, didn't, it wasn't an issue. <laughs> it, wasn't, like, it wasn't a game changer. It didn't break anything. No, no, no. Man, because, uh, you know, when someone did, did you feel like he really saw you in that moment? Or did you feel more I, upset by the? No, I didn't feel upset. I felt um, I felt I felt exposed rather than exposed. Ups, uh, upset. You right. know, I think I didn't. I didn't. It's you know, in many ways, if you look at at those categories, my and 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 it spurred me to understand what those mean. What does socially white mean? You know, and what does um, I know. I you know very clear about what politically black means. Um, but it, so it's that. It's like what do what do those kinds of ways of being in the world mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there is another um, looking that you do. That another. Um, this is. I, I found that it really interesting that this memoir is not a straight shot when it comes to looking at race, obviously. It stirs up more than it settles. Um, and you use, you pull in these other wonderful voices, voices, these other incredible writers who have always thought deeply about race and representation and belonging. Um, so I, I would love for you to talk a little bit about, about that, about the fact that, you know, we hear the voice of Richard Wright and like you mentioned, Carol Phillips and Dion Brand and um, mm. Thompson Highway, just these, yeah. just a richness of, of thought interwoven yeah. with your own. Um, what compelled you to draw writing into your writing in such a, such a way? Well, um, I, one of the things that um, there's that, opening um, in the in the classroom when I'm eight years old and I get asked what I am and I can't answer it and I um, and I then I say that that's probably the moment that I became a writer because I'm I, I became a seeker to answer that question as to what mm -hmm. and that um, and that and, and, and it was all around language and you know, it was around one word that I that, that I didn't know how to answer I didn't know what it was and so I became really kind of vigilant around language and I became um, a reader in order to try and find out um, all of those secrets all of those things that every I thought everybody knew and that I didn't know and so one of the things that um, I discovered in writing the book is how much I'm formed by those writers, you know, that that identity is not a um, it's it's, uh, you know, I, I grew up in in a, a very um, white suburb of, of um, Toronto. And so my blackness came from the books that I read those those what through the people that you've just mentioned. And so I have a, a sense of my, a deeper sense of who I am by what I read. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, you know, there, I, I also say in the book that I think we're all made up of all the stories that we've ever been told. Mm -hmm. And, and I think if we're actively seeking out certain stories over other stories, then, you know, we, um, we can be, be belong to those stories, we can become those stories. And I think there's a big part of my um, black identity that comes from those writers who I, who, 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 filled in some gaps for me that I wasn't getting in my education or, or in other places. So um, they were very, very important to my sense of identity. And the, the way that they're, they're, um, they're used or, or utilized in, in this is so, um, I think it's just, it's, it's just honoring so much of, 
of that work in a way, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a certain way that you can use writing in your writing that, that is not as honorific, but this felt very much like, um, I think, what was it that you said about Dion Brand's inventory? Yeah. Um, when you, because I remember being, it's inventory, isn't it? That's the name of it. I, I think yeah. it's from that. I think it's from yeah. that. Yeah. And you talk about inventory and you talk about feeling just the goose bumps and the, the, yeah. that thing that happened. And yeah. I remember clearly going to a reading of hers of that exact thing and having yeah. exactly yeah. the same response. Yeah. Dion is a, is a writer that um, I think, I, you know, I think is one of the key people in Toronto that formed my way of understanding myself as a, as a black woman. And um, I, you know, she's uh, amazing. And um, I think what she did for me that way is that, and I say this in the book is that she gave, it's like she gave me permission yes. to talk about bodies in trouble, to gave me permission to under, she unpicked um, something that was so obvious that inventory of lives and, and it was, and, 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 but she shone a light on that. And then, you know, was, was basically said to all of those people in the audience at the time that I was there, that this is, this is true and you need to talk about this. Mm -hmm. And I felt, and I felt like I'd been given um, a huge uh, ledge to stand on, to talk about those things. Mm. Do you feel, a, 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 I hate the word responsibility, but do you feel that this is what, you hope to achieve in your work as well, giving that ledge? Um, I hope so. Yeah, I can't, um, I can't, uh, I can't dare to hope to be as inspiring as Dion is, <laughs> but I, but I do, um, yeah, I do hope so. And I've had, you know, responses to the book that have really, um, uh, really amazed me and, um, made me feel very proud that I did that I chose to to do this because you know they're they're mixed race people who not just mixed race people but people who have never have said to me I've never seen myself in a book before no one has ever written about me and I think that and I don't exactly know who what that means in terms of them because you know it, it's about it's about my complexity and there are very few people have such a broad complexity, but I think that the, the issue is, is complexity itself because I've had, you know, white um, readers, women who, who said, you know, that, they, that they've never connected to um, a book in, in that way because it was um, so complex and it, and it spoke to them in their own complexities, so. Yeah, what, what I've read so far from right across the board, um, it's been called a call to action by, yeah. by some, it's been called a book about finding one's own personal courage. Um, some people felt relief in reading it, yeah. you know, like just a, yeah. a, the uh, ability to exhale after, after it. Um, what a varied response. I feel like that is such a victory. It's a gift. It's such a gift. I'm so grateful that, that, that I've had that, those readers and that they have connected to it. Um, because as you say, it is very personal and I, and I, I'm not sort of telling anybody how to, how to think about these things, but, and, and I'm, and I'm doing, you know, all that dissection on my own body and my own life, but it is a call to action because it, it it's a, it's a going through this and going through it, um, writing the book and going through it at a time where, you know, we have the climate crisis and we now have a new crisis, the COVID crisis. And it's, it's like, I we need to not live on this in this structure anymore. It's a call to action to get off the plantation to make something different happen. So, um, and I think I that I, I came to that through writing the book. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to read a little bit more. Sure. Um, just because this is a holiday Monday in Canada, <laughs> yes, the tradition yes. is to open the cottage at this juncture. Yeah, um, and you take us to that place with your own family um, at a at a cottage. Um, I would love for you to read a little bit from from that I will. passage. Yeah, uh, yeah. We're at my um, sister's cottage at this point. Um, 
There are wildfires burning not far from here, on the other side of the Trans-Canada Highway, the main thoroughfare towards the big water, Georgian Bay, Lake Huron, and beyond them, the biggest of the Great Lakes, Lake Superior. Some of the fires are out of control. There has been no rain. Evacuation warnings are in place. I remember childhood summers on lakes, camping, the taste of burnt marshmallows, a hot dog skewered along its entire length with care by my father while I took care, while I took care not to mention his veterinary skill with dogs for fear that it would be a bad joke. The stick would be barely long enough to reach the flames and I would feel the smoke in my throat. The wind would change and the smoke would drift in the opposite direction for a few minutes of relief, hitting my brother, sister, or cousins on the other side. I would hold tight to George the monkey while adults told stories around the fire. There are fires in so many places across Canada, Kamloops, Snowy Mountain, Whitetail Creek, all in British Columbia, and also Saddleworth Moor in England, Yosemite Valley in California, Kanita, Greece, Potsdam, Germany, Karbol, Sweden. And here in bed at the lake, I wonder if this is what the world will taste like now, a perpetual campfire. Everything is uncomfortable and urgent. My father's last word, my mother's grasp of the days, a plantation igniting. I remember that somewhere in the tropics, sugarcane is burning before the harvest. The loons call out again. I wonder what amends I thought I had to make to the different parts of myself in feeling the shame of race. What my whiteness, blackness, yellowness, and indigeneity have to do with one another. I wonder what kind of statement I need to make for my nieces and nephews on the history of their family, or if they are already making these connections much faster than I ever did. What I know, is that they need to make their lives a fully embodied, meaningful quest for their own authenticity. And they must avoid the greed that creates race, the lie of success. Oh, it's incredible. It's just really a wonderful work. It, it really is. Um, before I get to the questions, because I can't believe how much time, I mean, just like that. <laughs> Um, but we do have some um, some wonderful questions that have come in from um, the the folks. Um, but I wanted to ask about Canada because that is such a snapshot, a Canadian snapshot. And I wonder about growing up here. And I think about this all the time about how growing up here has shaped who I am as a mm. as a, a, a black woman. And I wonder about you and how Canada has shaped this examination of yourself through this book. If, if this could have happened if you were in yeah. Guyana or somewhere I, in the yeah. States. I don't think that had I, you know, my, my, had my family moved to London when, at the, instead of moving to Toronto, that I would have had the kind of, um, kind of complexity of those, those ideas and those um, approaches uh, to race and belonging, um, I think that the that the, the the discussion there is um, complicated because partly because of the um, First Nations issues, mm -hmm. and so it, it it encompasses a lot more than it does in the UK, which um, is very much about uh, you know the the colonial the empire and the and the colonial issues and the and the same issues around on um, uh, the plantation the same issues around uh, structure and hierarchy and class and uh, along with race but I think there's there's something there's there's Quebec and the, the French um, the Quebecois issues in history along with the First Nations issue, issues in the history of Canada that complicate the um, discussion in a, in a much more subtle way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it allows a different kind of conversation to happen both internally yeah. and externally. Um, I'm going to go to the, some questions. Um, here's a question from this is all from Instagram. So thank you for to all those IG folks who jumped on. Um, this question, I, I, I'm sorry about the names because everyone's in. So I'm just going to throw them out here uh, anonymously. Andre Alexis has some pointed and controversial things to say about his sense 
that others feel, feel he is obliged to write a certain way or about certain topics because of being a Black Canadian. Have you experienced a similar phenomena both in Canada and in the UK? Um, I haven't really experienced um, that in, in terms of an obligation because I have always dealt with race in, in everything that I've written. So um, it hasn't been something that I haven't wanted to do. But what I what I do talk about in the book is this sense that, you know, there, there's uh, be, before I became a writer, I think I wanted to or before I came the, the kind of writer that I am, I think I wanted to write about, um, you know, existential things. I wanted to write about my navel and write about beauty and write, you know, things that as a black woman, I'm not able to write because the realities of that in a, in a society are such that, you know, I write about, about that, you know, because it's still, there's still things to say and there's still important things to say. So um, I don't think that anybody has to write anything that they, you know, I don't think anybody can tell anybody to write what they need to write. But I don't think that for me, as um, a woman of color, that I can um, I can not be doing that. I might, you know, I, I'd like to write about my navel. You know, <laughs> maybe that's the maybe that's the missing the missing chapter. <laughs> chapter seven. It's <laughs> chapter nine. Something yeah. like that. Um, this is a great question. Have you always connected with myths and folklore? Was there a particular tale? that informed this analysis of your experience? Um, yes, I've always connected with myth, myth and folklore for sure. Um, but I think it's more about, um, you know, dealing with stories, you know, that I've always, I'm, I'm made of stories. I love stories. I love being inside stories. And so there's nothing in particular um, that sparked um, this, this way of looking at, at things, but it's, I, I'm, you know, I think, I'm con as writers, we are constantly myth making and story making and creating um, our own myths. And so, and, and reflecting others and reflecting things that we've read as we just talked about in terms of how important reading is to, to um, uh, a sense of belonging. So um, I think nothing in particular, but definitely words and words, words and words and words. Stories and stories upon yeah. stories, always. Yeah. Um, this is a, a good question as well. Uh, how did your process of writing a memoir differ from the approaches to your previous work? Um, agony versus <laughs> fun. <laughs> but which, um, which? which is which? I love writing fiction. I'd have so much fun writing fiction. And it's not that, that the memoir was agony um, so much as uh, agony to produce so much as you know one of the things um, my fabulous editor publisher Ann Collins had to do was to um, stop me from hiding um, in, in, in kind of abstract language you know to put myself in it in a, in a direct way and I love her for having done that but it was hard because these as you as you've said you know this is personal and so um, it's it, it's harder um it's hard you can't hide and i think fiction allows you to to you know play a lot more right right did you feel that um that it took like i think about courage in writing something like this um and and exposing oneself and when once you expose oneself like like this it it, it opens up a whole different kind of conversation we see this yeah. in, um, in social media, for example, you know, the, the minute that you bare your heart, it becomes um, fodder for anyone to jump in there. Did you feel that it, it took a certain amount of, of courage for you to, um, to write yeah, in this way? I don't think it was courage. I think it was insanity, maybe, but it wasn't courage. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's courageous. It feels like it's um, angry and urgent. And so it didn't feel like I needed, I just needed the anger in order to write it. I didn't need to be brave. I think the anger dro drove it. And, and then, and therefore um, it might look courageous, but it's, um, it feels like, uh, um, it feels like I, I had to, I had to say those things. Yeah, it was time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, James Baldwin talks about the role of 
the artist and the writer in times such as these, like yeah, in, in times where, um, and um, and he doesn't talk about courage either. He just just says that it is it is time for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I felt that because of my the complexity of my background that it you know that that, that there wasn't there wasn't a black and white you know there it, it wasn't um easily put one way that the complexity made it urgent the complexity made me I, I went okay okay I have to tell you this because this is my experience that mm -hmm. that kind of it, it felt more like that like I have to tell you this and therefore we have to look at this differently and we have to change how we're talking about it yeah um I'm gonna do one, another question. There's some great questions here. Some of them are so long <laughs> that they would really require us to really, um, un, you know, break it down. So, um, so we talked about your family history. So I'm gonna skip that one for now. Um, here's one for you, uh, Kai Kello. Hmm. Right. Um, is the author, uh, there's someone that's currently re reading uh, the book Dominoes at the cross yeah. Crossroads. Um, his short stories touch on some similarities. Are you familiar with some of his work and what Montreal Canadians or Quebecois Canadian authors have inspired and which ones have inspired you, if any? Yeah. Mm. I would, I'm desperate to read Kai's book. I know about it, but I haven't got it yet. I might have to order it from John and Quarterly. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and in terms of, um, I lived in, in Montreal for um, a few years. So I, I feel like I did, did get inspired by um, Quebecois writers and, and um, uh, Anglophone writers living in Montreal. I mean, originally Mary, Mary Claire Blair and um, Blay, sorry, Mary Claire Blay, sorry. And um, Michel Tremblay, those kind of um, early influences but I love when I first moved to to um, Montreal I um, read how to make love to a negro oh yes and um, and I became a huge fan of Danny Laferriere's yes and um, and recently I have read um, Kim Twee who I absolutely love and, and um, I find a beautiful delicate um, writer so um, those are the ones I can think of at the moment um I'm going to end with one of my own questions because okay. um, you end the book with this question circling back to the question that started it all, which is, what are you? Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the question you say. The question is, who are you? Mm -hmm. And it's a question that you're asking, not just yourself, but all of us to imploring all of us to a answer that, that question. Why that question? Because what are you is static. What are you is, you know, what's your background? Where, where have you come from? And who are you is now and it's active and it's what are you gonna do? You know, who are you in the face of anti-black violence? Who are you in the face of cultural genocide? Who are you in the face of the lack of, um, the loss of biodiversity on the planet and, and, the, and the destruction of, of the planet? Who are you in the face of structural inequality and poverty? Um, and so those, to ask that question forces someone to answer it uh, with action. You know, what are you gonna do when, when this comes in your, in your in your sphere you know who are you um in the in the face of of racism it, are you either you're anti-racist or you're um racist and so um it's an important active word who yeah thank you so much for this book thank it's you wonderful. Um, thank you garvia that's really nice to hear it, it's just wonderful and this brings us to the end of our event and a reminder that you can pick up shame on me for yourself or for your friends at uh libraire uh, drawn in quarterly in montreal um shipping canada wide and delivering the book orders by bike across all of montreal that's uh, brilliant you can visit them online and support this fantastic bookstore if you can and thank you tessa for sharing your passion and your wisdom thank you to the national art center for sharing this live stream and on behalf of d and q and random house canada thank you all for joining us it has been a pleasure tessa thank you so much thank you so much garvia my pleasure
Are we done? <laughs> I think we're still live.